Today we're going to begin section four, our last section of this chapter, and it's all about problem solving in chemistry because chemistry can be a very problem-based science. Our goals or objectives for this section are to identify two general steps in problem solving, describe three steps for solving numeric problems, and describe two steps for solving conceptual problems. Now what is learning? Memorization of facts is a relatively small part of learning chemistry. To succeed in chemistry, you must become a good problem solver. So what are some good problem solving methods or techniques? We're going to be looking at that today. And is there always just one right answer? And I would say it depends on the problem. To be a good problem solver, you must learn to develop and implement plans. In order to develop a plan, you must identify what you already know and also what you need to know. The more problems that you try, the better you'll get at the problem solving process. It will come easier to some students than to others, but it will come to all of you if you continue to try. Remember that science is problem solving. You cannot give up before you start or you will fail. You cannot expect every problem to fall into a specific category that you already know how to work. This would be working exercises. This would not be problem solving. In the laboratory, you will often be presented with more data than is needed to solve a problem. You will need to sort your essential data from extraneous data. So essential data are those pieces of information that you have to have to solve the problem. Extraneous data is extra stuff that, although informative, is not going to actually be used as you solve the problem. Sometimes it's helpful to sort data into knowns and unknowns to be able to determine what data you need in order to solve a problem. All of this is part of the first step, analyzing the data. The known information may be data like measurements, or it may even be an equation that relates the variables involved, something like distance is equal to rate times time. If the unknown information is a numerical value, it is helpful to determine what the units for the answer should be. This can help you to determine how to set up a problem. We're going to learn how to do this. It's, the process is known as dimensional analysis. Let's say you're trying to set up an equation relating volume V, density D, and mass M. You want your volume in cubic centimeters. Your mass was given in grams, and your density was given in grams per cubic centimeter. You think the relationship might be volume is equal to density over mass. So you test it out with just the units. This is the dimensional analysis part. Here's what you find. Here's our initial formula that we think might be right. Volume equals density over mass. And as you see here, what we've done is we've put in the units, cubic centimeters in place of V for volume. Grams per cubic centimeter is put in in place of D for density. And grams is on the bottom where mass was. As we try to see if the left side equals the right side, we can change that division problem involving a fraction into a related multiplication problem. So we could take grams per cubic centimeter divided by grams, and we can change it into this related multiplication problem, grams per cubic centimeter multiplied by the reciprocal of grams, or 1 over g. When we simplify this, we can see we have grams on the top, grams on the bottom. Those would cancel, and that would leave us with units of 1 over cubic centimeters. Now, wait a second. Does that look right? Cubic centimeters is not equal to 1 over cubic centimeters. So this formula is not written correctly. However, if you look, the only thing is the right side needs to be flipped over. So if we flip that over, the formula would then read volume is equal to mass over density. Then we would have cubic centimeters equals cubic centimeters, and we'd know that we'd set the problem up correctly, and this is the way the formula should actually look. Once the givens are known, the goal is identified, and a plan of attack has been decided upon. In other words, an equation has been chosen to model the situation. Now it's time to do the calculations or crunch the numbers. One thing to check before you begin your calculations is look to see whether your units are in agreement. You can't have time in seconds in one part of the problem and hours in another part. It just doesn't work. 
if your units don't agree, then you're going to have to use some unit conversions so that you get them to agree. As an example, if you have speed in meters per second, that's a distance over a time, right? But so meters per second, but your time in the problem is in hours then you've got a problem because you've got time in seconds and time in hours. So you could change your time from hours to seconds so that the time units do agree. Here's an example. If I had a time of two hours but my speed was given in meters per second, I would need to change that two hours into seconds. So I know that there's 60 minutes in an hour and 60 seconds in a minute. Using dimensional analysis, I can see that I can take 60 minutes over an hour and that will cancel out those hours. And then take 60 seconds over a minute and that will allow the minutes to cancel. So multiplying 2 times 60 times 60 gives me 7,200 and my units would be seconds because all the other units would cancel. Are we done yet? And the answer is course not. We need to check to see if our answer is reasonable. Does it make sense? You are not done the moment the calculations are finished. If it does not make sense, you should check to make sure you substituted correctly. That's one of the main mistakes that people make is they set it up properly, but then they put a number in the wrong place. Also, check to make sure you didn't make any math errors. If you're using a calculator, perhaps you hit a button wrong on your calculator, so you've got it right on the paper, but the calculator is wrong because you punched it in wrong. Also, recheck your units to make sure all of your units are in agreement. Maybe that's what's causing the problem and giving you an answer that doesn't seem to make sense. One way to check your work is to estimate your answer by rounding off all of the numbers involved to some nearby easy to work with numbers before doing the calculation. Your actual answer, when using the original value, should come out reasonably close to your estimate. You should also check to make sure that you're using the correct number of significant figures and using scientific notation if it's appropriate. Now, these two concepts we will come back to in Chapter 3. We're not quite ready for those yet. There are 3,600 seconds in an hour. How many seconds are there in one day? So this is our problem. First thing we do is identify the known. We know that there's 3,600 seconds in an hour. We also know that the unknown is how many seconds are there in one day. So we don't know the number of seconds in a day. What relationship do we still need? Well, we need to know the number of hours in a day. That's common knowledge. It wasn't written in the problem, but most people at your age know that there are 24 hours in one day. Now we're ready to analyze and calculate. We're going to use that dimensional analysis so that we can see that we want to end up with seconds per day. That's what our answer needs to be in. So if we look at the other values we have, seconds per hour and hours per day, we can see that to get those units of seconds per day, we can multiply these values, seconds over hours times hours over day, the hours will cancel, and you will then have your units that you want seconds per day. Now we can put in the numbers since we've figured out how we need to set it up to get the answer to work out. 3,600 seconds per hour times 24 hours per day is going to be 86,400 seconds in a day. Are we done? Well, we need to ask ourselves, is it reasonable? If we do an estimate by rounding 3,600 up to 5,000, and rounding 24 hours down just to 20 hours. Then multiplying those together, 5,000 times 20 gives us 100,000. When we compare that to our answer, 86,400, they're fairly close together. Remember, we did do quite a bit of rounding with 3,600 changing to 5,000. So there's a little bit of a discrepancy there, but not enough to say our answer is incorrect. So those were some mathematical problems. Now, what about conceptual problems? There are some problems that will not require calculations. You have to think it through. It is still important to start out by identifying what you know and what you're wanting to know. So we need to analyze the problem still. Then a solution can be found. A lot of the times, creating a model or drawing a picture may help to solve the problem and many early scientists performed something called thought experiments to help them solve the problems. As an example, Galileo had a thought experiment. He was trying to figure out 
Do heavier objects fall faster than lighter objects? So he pictured two bricks in his head, and he pictured them falling, and they'd fall so far in, in a second, right? And then he said, well, what if I took those two bricks and I connected them together with something really lightweight, so I now have one object instead of two. And connected together, are they going to fall faster than the two bricks fell by themselves? Or will they fall at about the same rate? What he determined is that heavy objects will fall as fast as lighter ones. And that heavy objects do not fall faster. Here's another conceptual problem. Manny has to run six errands between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. on Saturday. He has to get a haircut, wash his car, buy stamps, rent a video, return a library book, and buy some groceries. Assume that each errand will take 30 minutes and that Manny will only do one errand per hour. He's got to, you know, get between the places. He will stop for a lunch break between 12 and 1. We're going to use information on the following drawing to figure out a way for him to accomplish all of this. So as we look at the drawing, we can see that here are six locations and they're open during different parts of the day. So we're going to use this information as we now try and get him through his entire set of tasks. Each place that he needs to visit is open for a limited number of hours on Saturday. Remember, he has to do his errands between 10 and 12 and 1 and 5 because he's taking that one hour lunch break and he can only do one errand per hour. He must do two errands before lunch then and four errands after lunch. As we look at this diagram, we can see that the post office and the library are only open in the morning other than during his one hour lunch break. The barber shop and the car wash close earlier than the video store and the supermarket is open really late. So one possible solution would be to go to the post office and the library in the morning, then go to the barber shop, the car wash and the video store and save the supermarket visit until last. Remember to use these problem solving techniques as you work through the problems in chemistry this year. There will be some chapters that are more problem based than others, but in all areas, these problem solving techniques can help you.